You are listening to the Hello Sport Podcast. What's up, punters and dribblers? Welcome back to the Hello Sport Podcast. I have a qualified opinion and a wavering bias. Bit of a Thursday all talk for your ass. One of the big ones. Yeah. One of the greats. A golden girl? A golden girl. We were a bit delayed last week, but a golden girl uh, has joined the show. Three-time Olympic medalist. Three-time Olympic gold, gold medalist. medalist. Shame on you. She's a one, two, three, four, five, maybe a six-time Olympic medalist. Mm. From Penrith. Do you know who we're talking about? From the Riff. You got any fucking ideas? She likes to paddle. Getting one it the- yet? You getting it? Now, I actually forgot to ask her this. Peek behind the fucking curtain. We uh, record these afterwards. The stats that uh, Cody Totes knocked up. Career success. Olympic debut, 18 years of age. In the 2012 Summer Olympic Games in London. Silver in the K1 there. Bronze in the K1 in 2016 and 2020, gold in the K1 2024, gold in the C1 in 2020 and 2024, 51 World Cup gold medals. I don't even know how that's possible, considering she's only 30. 10 times World Cup championship titles, four times Olympic medals. That doesn't seem right. Good rating. Two, three, four, five, six. Either way, serious stats on the gal. Unbelievable. Paddling royalty, Tom. Paddling royalty, Jess Fox. Get it in ya. I think this is the first podcast I've done. I hope we're recording that. In, Are we recording? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, as in like in a studio? Done what? Oh, no, I have done. Usually a lot of them are on Zoom, though. It's been ages. They're not as good on Zoom, no, in our opinion. In our, yeah. in our humble opinion. In our humble, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Zooms, Zooms are, you just sort of, the, you lose the, yeah. you know. Especially with Australian internet, where it's like a one-second delay. You just can't get into like everyone else in the world can do it. Can we do it. Yeah, that's it. You see international like podcast media companies doing. It, and you're like, oh, this looks beautiful. Well, I saw they're never in the same room. No, and we tried it, and it's like just a mess. We had a guy who's like the Gold Coast. Like, it's not that far away, and it was like you may as well not be on the same planet as us. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it's taken that nice long. It's nice to not have lag with you today. Thank you for coming in, and as we predicted, bang on time. We were like. You just present like well, someone a pi- who like is a pinch just, early. Which, well, actually, you're right. A pinch early. You know what I mean? <laughs> which is on time. Well, it's just what winners do. Yeah. We could just say, we, we, you were standing out there and Eddie just goes, oh, she's here on time. And I was like, no surprise there. Like, just see. Punch and then it. I was reading, we were reading at 99 in your, in your ATAR, UAI, you know. <laughs> discipline. Is discipline. that just discipline? Yeah, just um, perfect in every way, of course. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think... I have Millie to thank for getting me on time because sometimes I'm not. Oh, really? I'm always punctual for a race start line, though. That's you know, good. can't miss that. That's important. Have yeah. you ever slept in, <laughs> like in the day of a race? And wake up in um, panic? Yeah, but usually, if, you know, I allow like two hours to get to the race. Yeah. Like on, you know, Something would have to really so, go wrong for you to yeah, be late. You would have missed a, a race. I would, have, I would have missed plenty of races. Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not the most punctual. Person. I'm not bad, but I'd certainly have fuck ups. You've in got me. loss in you. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. Probably like the world champs, like a semi or something. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that's like haunts my dreams is that I, I do something like that. Um, do you have your medals on you or is this. I literally forgot them today. Okay, I'm really so not sorry. punctual. Not, no. not as. Not as not, not, she's all cracked up to be, mate. Uh, but I, it makes me realise people just want me for no, see the medals. So. You're not just me. You are more than your medals, but not much more. Well, when I see the shrine you've created here, like the memorabilia and everything, mm. I think we need to get some medals in there. Well, we might. Well, listen, I don't want to ask for your medals yet. No, but ask one of the swimmers who have like 10. Mm, you know, that's true. Sure Although, well, aren't, you, aren't you now second all time for individual gold? I think you are. Um, I'm not, I don't know the stat, but I think it's this Kayleigh definitely McEwen. was, um, yeah, it was definitely a big games for me in terms of hitting some records. Yeah. yeah. Well, is that, is that a bit of a, a, a wig out considering there was a period there where you said like you were, you were, it was such a, it felt like it was eluding you to some degree, like the gold that now you're second all time. Yeah. I, it's hard to believe. Like I had no idea about those stats and um, yeah, like you said, London, silver, Rio bronze, Tokyo bronze, finally got the gold in the canoe and then the kayak and then defending in Paris was just amazing. Like, mm. it's just been such a crazy 
I can't believe it was three weeks ago, but it was, yeah. you know, all the dreams came true and now it's good to be home though, to share it with everyone and soak it up a little bit. Yeah. In particular in the K1, are you, before the final, are you, do you ever once think about the, yeah. the failures at past Olympics? Not failures, but like the missed goals. Yeah. Is that I, in your mind? I was probably not the day of, but in the week leading up or the couple of weeks leading up to the games, there's those doubts that are definitely there and... Mm. Things like, you know, I'm training and going, oh, like I'm not feeling good and this boat isn't turning like it should. And, you know, even thinking about switching my equipment the week before and then realising, no, come on, chill. Yeah. You know what you're doing. But then the day of the race, I just felt really calm and confident and like I was ready for it. Whatever happened, I was at peace with whatever would happen Mm -hmm. and just kind of maybe the fact that I'd won gold in Tokyo helped alleviate that uh, feeling of, uh, you know, missing the gold. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I definitely was hungry for it. Like I wanted to get it in the kayak and it's such a good feeling when you're able to deliver those runs as an yeah. athlete, deliver the performance that you need to under pressure. Mm. Was it the K1 first? Yeah. So you like, if memory serves, the semi didn't go that well? Yeah, semi was like... Or did you do that on purpose? Uh, no, I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> I um, I was a bit like shaky in the semi I think I was a bit nervous Mm -hmm. and the course was really hard and I was a bit stressed about a certain move in the middle section that's six seven eight um move that you Mm -hmm. had to catch away we were concerned about that move a lot of people were stuffing it up as I said it's all about the middle of the course it's all about the middle middle. yeah your commentary was spot on um (laughs) and but then when I finished eighth I was like actually that's a good spot to be in because in Tokyo I was last uh, I was first of the semi so Mm -hmm. last to start in the final and when you're eighth, you're, you know, fourth or fifth to start. Mm. And you can kind of set the pressure on everyone else. You can set the bar for the time to beat. Mm-hmm. So I was sort of going in in that mindset of, okay, I'm going to try and put pressure on the other girls and make them chase me as opposed to when you're last to start and you're hearing all the times and you know what you've got to do. And that intensity and anticipation, anxiety mm. mounts mm. a lot mm. more. Well, that seemed to work because I, was it who went first? She ended up getting third. Um, she's she in America. It seemed like people or, just seem to be. Like no, you're thinking of Evie. That's in the canoe. Okay. But yeah, she yeah, was first sorry, off. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking. The sorry. Canoe. Yeah. 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 First off, and then on the podium. Yeah. And just pressure <laughs> was just like continued. To <laughs> See, because that was that one where. So that was the canoe. Was that second? Was it? That was the second oh, one. Yeah. For some reason, I thought that was first as well. No, was kayak was first. Early mornings. It was. You guys were committed. I'm so oh, impressed. Yeah. But yeah, like so addictive. <laughs> so yeah, it was. There's something it's, about slalom where. There's speed and they update you with how, if you're Where up you're or at under, and then yeah. it's about penalties. It's like yeah. addictive to watch. But that one, so that was the canoe the set where you, well, I think you were second last, weren't you? Yeah. And that was where it was like, holy shit, okay, like we're on now. Like what yeah. are you going to do? And you didn't just like, didn't you knock like four seconds off the time or something? Yeah. Also, that penalty was bullshit. You definitely <laughs> broke 100. Yeah, it That's was. bullshit. I've but. seen the tapes. You can't tell me you that for sure. Are there any sensors in that or is that just someone no, like eyeballing it's, it? It's So there's judges on the bank who are looking. There's three judges. And then there's also a video judge. And so they review and they're watching different mm. angles. Yep. Um, it was tiny. It was tiny. I'm prepared to say you, you missed it by a mile. But... <laughs> That was that was a pure moment where not a, like did you feel what was the pressure like in that one because that's where you are going last and yeah. had some the, the girl who came second the German El Elka was Elena that? Lilik yes Lilik. she'd she'd set a really good time yes and I was warming up and I heard the crowd and I heard her screaming because she has this like she had a huge reaction when she crossed the line she was mm. screaming super high pitched and I was trying to hear. I was like, okay, she's obviously gone into the lead. What's her time? And I'm trying to hear and listen to the loudspeaker as I'm warming up down the bottom. And then I hear 103. And I was like, whoa, that's a good time. Yeah. Like from the semi final, I think I'd done a 106 or seven or something. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, she's, she's set the bar, so we'll chase it. And I think it was put me in a really good state of let's challenge, let's see what I can do. And um, I felt fierce on that start line i was like getting into my your your start line <laughs> face is is fierce yeah it's scary but in that particular like you got up there and we looked at each other and we were like 
Oh, she's ready. This is, this <laughs> is, could just she's on. <laughs> how, do, how do you, have you, do you train mentally for those moments? Is that something that comes naturally to you? Like, can you explain what the process was like from hearing the scream to like getting up onto the start? Yeah. Line? Well, I sort of tried to, once I knew the time, switch off a little bit from any commentary or the race because I knew she had a medal for sure. And then I was just visualising my race and I thought, yeah, 102, 101, you know, I think I can do that. And I knew the areas I needed to nail. And so I was just sort of focusing on the key things like, you know, being balanced and and then it's just like breath work, self-belief, um, turning off any negative chatter, soaking in the atmosphere of the crowd, you know, embracing like the moment of being at the Games in an Olympic final, hoping to defend an Olympic title. Mm. Like it's a really awesome, unique experience but it can also be terrifying, crippling, overwhelming if you let it. But if mm. you kind of are open to using it as good energy, then mm. it can be really powerful. And then, yeah, I get into my like focused face, which was really hard because we had a crowd that was mm. unreal. Yeah. And the loudspeaker, they'd set up this speaker like right next to the start. And uh, I heard him say... Um, all right, are there any Aussies in the crowd? And, you know, the Aussies, there were heaps of them. And they were just so loud and so awesome. Mm. And I could even see some Aussies at the start line, like in my peripheral vision, waving their flags, like, jazz, go jazz. And I've got to be like... Poised. Yeah, you know, RBF, mm. resting bitch face, just like <laughs> staring down, not not zoning into any of that because that's how I get into my, into my zone. Mm. Very, very impressive. Like the whole time I'm looking at that, I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do it? How do you get put in the performance you put in under that sort of pressure? Like yeah. I just marvel at that sort of thing. Would you say that that was one of your, your most purest performances? Uh, yeah, I think it was up there. I think it was up there in terms of Olympic races to be able to race freely and like without any fear mm. because I think that's what's held me back a little bit in my last um you know Tokyo kayak Rio kayak as well there mm. were different things that were like the wind or the weather or you know the pressure and the intensity of the moment were sort of making me a bit tense and racing under my capacity in that mm -hmm. I was like trying not to make a mistake as opposed to trying to do my best race. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to do that in the canoe, I knew halfway down when I heard the roar of the crowd that I was up on the time and that I was, you know, putting down a good race. And then when I got out of the last upstream gate, I was like, just get the last two gates. Yeah. <laughs> You're on a good run. And so, yeah, it was definitely one of the best runs I've done. Now your mum's French. You yeah. were born in, in, in France. That must have been just the most incredible experience to do it in, in Paris. It was. I think we knew going in that it was going to be a special games because of that connection, being born in France, mum being French. Um, and then when Noemi qualified, my sister, you know, we, we were able to share that experience together. So I always felt like these were going to be my games and these were going to be special. Like I wanted it to be um, you know, the me embracing that experience and seizing that moment. And so I think, you know, we all lent into it, like spending a lot of time there in the lead up training to be as best prepared as we could. Um, you know, the way th things fell into place, like being flag bearer oh, yes, and yeah. on the river Seine, like it was just such a beautiful, incredible experience. And yeah, with mom, I think it was super special for her because she was a, an Olympian of France and then, mm. you know, gets to be a coach of two gold medal winning yeah. daughters. Like it was just perfect. How she, was the uh the flag bearing in the in the pissing rain in, in France? Oh. It looked like a, a good time, even though it was very damp. Yeah, <laughs> we had a great time. We were drowned rats. Like I could have if I'd stood under the shower, I would have looked the same. Like mm. it was just relentless rain and we were absolutely drenched, but Loved it. Had a great time. The Eiffel Tower sparkled at the end. It was just magic. How long were you out there for? Because I watched the replay a lot. on uh, on stand, but I couldn't get a sense for how long the athletes were out there for. It was, I think, like a 45-minute okay. boat trip. Yep. Um, but we were there for probably two hours, like before and after kind yeah. of. Um, yeah, it was long, but it was, it was good. It was very different to a stadium experience. And like we were sharing the boat with... Mm. Um, 
I can't remember, two other countries, Zimbabwe, I think, mm. and Zambia. And so you're sort of, it, it was a bit of a weird experience in the, that vibe. Um, but yeah, the Aussies had a great time. We all had these hideous fluoro green and yellow ponchos for a, a lot of it, <laughs> which we had to whip off when the cameras came out. But um, yeah, good fun. How did you, when did you find out you were going to be, like, when did they offer you that role? So, um, Anna Mears. Um, Chef de Mears. Chef de Mears. Chef de Mears. <laughs> Chef de Mears, yeah. Chef de Mears. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. She was an amazing leader. And she um, asked me back in March, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I'd known for a while and I had to keep the secret, not mm. tell anyone, field all the questions and, you know, it was a hard secret to keep, but. Yeah, it was a huge honour to do yeah. that with Eddie Ockenden and yep. yeah, it was an amazing experience. He's like third cousins with my wife, so that's my sort of cousin. Oh. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Like every time you go down to Tasmania, we go down there a little bit, he's on the back page every single time. Yeah. Oh, really? He's like a hero. He's, he's a, a Tasmanian Tasmania. treasure. He's an yeah. absolute treasure <laughs> and, a, and a good man of any Have yeah. you got a chef de mish in your future? I could see you being a chef de mish one day. Chef de mish? I, um, I don't even exactly know. Is it just like team captain sort of a thing? Or like yeah, a, I mean, it's a... It's a big role. You're essentially, yeah, you're the one leading the team and, mm. and dealing with the organisation of, of the team, getting them there, supporting them on ground and mm. getting back and the media and all of that. So she did an amazing job. Uh, pff, who knows? Maybe, maybe one day. Um, but I love this Australian Olympic team. Like mm. they, we were the most successful team. Um, ever. Yeah. Ever. And that's just so special and so proud to be part of it and love them all. So I for sure will be involved um, either supporting athletes once I retire, you know, in any way I can. Now, I just, it seemed to me like you lucked out with that shadow you were staying in, that big chateau and everyone's just in the village and you're in basically like an aristocrat's house. Yeah, I was trying to work that out. <laughs> I'm like, who? <laughs> how did, how did that end this up? up? <laughs> like if I was in the athletics team and I'm sleeping on a cardboard box, I'd be like, <laughs> What the fuck's going on here? And you're just sharing these crazy videos. I'd be like, I feel like I've been. This is bullshit. Here. Yeah. This is not my Olympics here. What the hell's <laughs> going on? Where, is that because you guys were out somewhere else? Yeah, we were quite far from the village and our venue. Um, yeah, it, it was just a performance decision to stay close to um, the Whitewater venue and the rowing venue. So with the rowing team, Canoe Slalom and Canoe Sprint team, we were all out in this chateau mm. and it was incredible. Um, you know, we... We're all a bit sad to not be in the village when we found out. We were like, oh, that's a shame. Like, it's always the best vibe and yep. you're part of the team and mm -hmm. you see everyone. And then when we turned up, we were like, this will be fine. Yeah, mm, this will be will okay. Be. Did it was you not know what incredible. it was going to be? No, we didn't. Wow. I mean, I hadn't – some people did. I didn't really know what to expect. But they did an amazing job sort of making it feel Aussie and had all the signage up and we had the Duna cover and, um, yeah, a big screen up watching – the racing, but yeah, we were very lucky to to be out there, and um, it was just the best to be able to be so close to our venue. Ringing that huge bell every time you come. Ringing the goal. bell. That was, like that was yeah, that was so nice when I won my medal and drove in, and all the rowers were out there, and and my teammates, um, yeah, cheering me home, and I got to mm. ring the bell, and they actually nobody really knows what that bell was for. I don't know if it was back in the day. That's where the how people would ring the bell to meet the king or yeah, whoever lived right. there. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah. And the castle you're staying at. Yeah. Yeah. Punters and Dribblers brought to you by Four Pines, Japanese lager, the tastiest fucking beer in town. It's absolutely fucking ridiculous how good it tastes. I didn't like, I mean, you know, you, you sort of you hear Japanese lager, you don't necessarily know what to think. And then well, like, you have a Japanese lager, you're like, oh, the Japanese have it fucking sorted out. Well, you say to yourself, where in God's name has this lager been my whole life? Turning Japanese, I, I think, think I'm turning, turning Japanese, Japanese. I really, I really think, think so. so. And you might be sitting there going, you're, you're talking shit, Tom and Eddie. You're only saying that because you're sponsored by Incorrect. Incorrect. Go and try one, bruh. Yeah. Go and have a Japanese lager, four pints a dish and tell me tell me it doesn't fuck the house down it does it fucks the house all the way down funnily enough they're also going to be fucking the house down at shorty's uh they're the main beer sponsor of our golf day at shorty's of course because we only we only, we only settle up next to the best baby yeah we only settle up next to the best mm -hmm. i think i'm turning japanese i think i'm turning japanese i really, really think, think so. so four pints you can get it everywhere was do you have big nights after gold medals or are you, are you I mean, it can be. 
<laughs> I had one one pretty big night. Nice. Yeah. But is that like with a race to go? Oh no no no. Okay. No, yeah, no. Right. At say. the end. No. At, at the, the end. end. Yeah. See, we get we don't think that way. It's no, like, we listen. Did you get up after the first night? I'm just like winning. Where'd you get pissed after your first gold? But it's exhausting. Like. Uh, so when I won the kayak, I probably didn't get to bed until midnight, 1am because you're doing media. Well, first you've got to do drug testing, then you've got a press conference and then you're doing more media and TV. Um, and then by the time you get back, you eat dinner, maybe you've got to do physio or recovery and then you're just wired to, you know, you're too excited to sleep. But at the end of it, yeah, after competition, we went out, we had a good time and celebrated. I love that. That's great. Now... Your mum is just such an infectious sort of personality, which her jump at you, the two of you jumping in the water at the end was just one of the most pure moments when no Amy won. Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh, it was, I turned into this like animal (laughs) cheering her on. I was like running down, screaming, just almost like trying to get all my energy that Mm. I had out Mm. to her to will her to the finish line. And when she crossed the line in first, it was just... Like ugly tears, screaming, crying, and I just jumped in because she was taking too long to get to the edge to give <laughs> us a hug. So I was like, I need to get in the water here and give her a hug. <laughs> and and then uh, Titoa, her coach, jumped in, and then Mum was on the back. There's this funny footage of her like jumping up and down, clapping, and then she did this weird like scissor kick <laughs> when she jumped in. <laughs> but it was yeah, such a moment of pure joy and yeah. euphoria. How does that that feel? Obviously, there's like the the, the round where you lose. Uh, to know Amy and she goes through where there's disappointment tied in there. But like having a sibling who is doing the same thing as you are, but you're, you are the golden child. <laughs> uh, but her then being able to have this moment, that was a first qualification as well. Yeah. Right? So she tried and, and, and failed to qualify in the past. Well, it was the first time that there wasn't the kayak cross event. Which so in the strongest. past, yeah. And in the past for her to qualify, she would have had to beat me mm. for the kayak or the canoe. Ah. And so, oh, so you were keeping her out of the Olympics. So I was keeping her out of the game. So she, yeah, managed to seize it, qualified in June, which was the best day ever, you yeah. know, seeing her achieve that dream. And then, yeah, not only qualified, but won the thing. Yeah. And on her first try, it took me four goes to get it in the kayak, <laughs> yeah. but she did it on her first go. So is there a sense of relief in that as well, in that, like, you know, she's now able to have her own story? She's not just... She's not just your yeah. sister in the in the world of it. I think there have been feelings of guilt or, you know, around the fact that for her to achieve her dream, it felt like I was blocking her for a while. Mm. Um, so to see her step out of that shadow, to seize the moment, lean into it and work so hard and actually perform the way she did was amazing. Like there's no disappointment on my end for not getting that third gold medal that everyone was talking about Mm. because it was so much joy seeing her do it and seeing her perform that way and yeah I'm just so happy for her Mm. to be able to live this as an Olympic champion now it's amazing the only person we really feel sorry for is old Papa Frank, <laughs> yeah. who just got the, the drive-by of all drive-bys from you, I believe, where it's I like, yeah, Dad, now the only one oh. without an Olympic medal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so savage with that comment. I still <laughs> I feel guilty about it, but um, he, he takes it well, and I think he's you know, super proud. It's also proud. not untrue. Well, no, it's completely no. true. I think that's probably, probably why it hurts but more. But 10-time world champion, so you yes. know, he was quite successful. It's a shame... There weren't – so the Olympics came in in 92 for slalom. Mm -hmm. So if they'd been earlier, if he'd been able to go previously, I'm sure he would have smashed it. Listen, that sounds like you're just trying to make it sound nice. I know. Very diplomatic. Yes. After being – after after a brutal drive. Yeah, the girls girls in our family are the golden girls. Yes, the golden girls. (laughs) Now, have we got eyes set on LA? Are we that too early to tell? No, yeah. I I mean, I'm not planning on – Retiring. I think everyone's asking what's next straight straight after the games. It's always a bit tough because you're like, I need a break. I need yeah. to. Um, but I've actually got a couple of races uh, still to come to finish out the season. How far? Like how far away are those? Uh, end of September. So are they hard to get up for? Yeah. Well, I think yeah, a little <laughs> bit. But I remember the feeling in Tokyo. Uh, I went back to Europe afterwards and raced the World Cups and. I remember sitting on the start line and being like, I'm not motivated compared to the Olympics. You know, mm. this feels quite flat. But then I remember thinking, but I actually don't want anyone else to win. So <laughs> that was yeah, my motivation right. <laughs> was like, however you can find the motivation, you got to 
get yourself the up for it. Pure competitiveness. Yeah. Just like not wanting anyone to win. Were you both super competitive growing up or is that something that developed? I think we've always been competitive. Like we've got these, I remember seeing these home videos of us doing like swimming races in the backyard pool and if Noemi beat me, I'd be a bit of a sore loser and <laughs> get upset or, you know, running races and yeah, we were always sporty kids and I loved competing and she sort of started paddling a bit later. I think she was a bit scared for a while. Um, but yeah, we've always been pretty competitive. Yeah. Do you think that's a key ingredient for your success? Like you driving each other on? I think definitely has helped being able to train together and be on tour together as teammates and sisters and having that camaraderie and, and support for each other during the ups and downs has been massive. And for her, you know, being able to train with me being world number one she saw the level she had to be at and could work on that every day and I could push her every day so I think we've definitely helped each other and we're sparring partners as well this year in the kayak cross so yeah it's been a pretty awesome thing to be able to share together as training partners and also competitors and sisters yeah I think there's always like this at least Tom and I have talked about imagine what it would be like to have uh, a child that's world champion olympic champion something but having your parents done the sport that you are now in must just be another layer of pride, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, for a long time they didn't really push us to paddle. It yep. was like, if you guys want to paddle, we want you to be able to, you know, sit in a kayak and do the basics so that we can go on a family kayaking trip kind of thing. Mm. Um, but eventually, you know, they realised we were competitive and we enjoyed it. So they sort of were able to nurture that passion and it's something that when we realised who they were and what they'd achieved in their sport... Mm. Um, I think I was always a bit nervous being in their shadow and being compared to them when I was growing up. But once I broke out of that, I think it made it a little bit easier and I could sort of forge my own path. But then for Noemi, it was an extra layer of, yeah. you know, these are the parents, but then also this is her sister. Um, so, yeah, to see her now have her moment is, is pretty cool. And, yeah, our parents are just super proud. I was reading – it was – did you break like were you not keen on getting in the boat getting in the pa in the paddling game and then you broke your arm or something and it was like a rehab decision Yeah a little bit so when you're young you can only do the flat water kayaking so okay. just on on a lake basically mm -hmm. and I always found that super boring um and so did gymnastics and swimming and broke my arm and our physio was like well you should probably just yeah go for a paddle um, rehab it a little bit mm -hmm. and I think at the time I was more motivated to get a tan because the arm coming out of the cast is like white and <laughs> yeah. hairy you know mm. and so I was like okay <laughs> I'll get in the kayak for that and then just sort of started to enjoy it a little bit more and was at 13 is when you can get or 12 when you can get on the rapids and that's had that first taste and yep. loved it so never looked back. Is that on the Nepean? The on the Nepean is the flat water, but oh, then there's the, the Penrith water. Lakes as well, and the Whitewater Stadium's just on the, the lakes. Is that okay. where they had the Olympics? Yeah. Yep. You guys yeah. should come out one day. We should Dude, go yeah, out there. We, well, I thought you were referring – I've met you years ago. Oh. I went out there. You wouldn't remember. And I was like, there's no way your memory's that good. Uh, we went out there for New South Wales Institute of Sport. Were you, were you involved with them? And we did yeah. interviews and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you – Dave Law, do you remember him? Yeah. Yeah. I was there that day. And oh. I was like, like 10 years ago. <laughs> It's very different. Like and the ends like, this kind of media is very amazing. different to this kind of media. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Old okay. school. That was like little articles and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, was that when you well, were I've working been out there? And it's, it's you, what was it? Was it was that the Red Bull? Were you working for Red Bull or was that? So the, he was a sports PR company. So he had BMX Australia. We had N Swiss. And yeah. Like part of that was to go out there. I think it was the N Swiss Awards. Maybe was coming. Oh, okay. Up. I don't Long know. Long time ago. Anyway, I've been out to the the course. Oh, I'd really? love to go out there and hop in the yeah, boat. Yeah, you Dude, should. I, would love I mean, to. they used to do that. Are you thinking of like the Red Bull Rapids where they like people would build their own, try and build their own rafts oh, and get down the no, rapids? Oh, no, no. It's in like where they're making it out of like beer boxes and all that sort of yeah, shit. Yeah, trying, like, float down. <laughs> I mean, listen, I'll do that too. But I would also like, I've been whitewater rafting, but it was in like blow up paddles and we just did it as a boys trip and yeah. it was very so. different to what we are talking about. But I've been on the rapids though, mate. I'm a rapids guy. But would you take us out? Yeah. Not in a kayak, but like in a raft, or okay. maybe like a blow up. Like we're not we're not up to kayak standards, you don't think? Oh, it's I mean, just, I wouldn't be sh I'd be shocked if I was. Uh, not in what I'm using, like not in the <laughs> on your knees. You can sit on your knees in a canoe. You're sitting on your knees. What if we went yeah. down in like a three man and you just we don't have a we don't have a paddle? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're and that would be terrified. hard for me because it's like... Because <laughs> we're heavy. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's two of you, but the, I think um, you could probably do the two-person inflatable. That would be good to see. Yeah, okay. You oh, and yeah. me go. I on. wouldn't even need to be in no, there with you. You, just, just, I you just coach l- like your mum on the side. You run down just yeah. screaming at us. Yeah, and I just see how far you got. Yeah, you saw our out. paddling work on the, on the bed. It was impressive. Mm. It was, you know, yeah, the... It, the stroke rate was very good. Yes, well, very impressive. There wasn't any water <laughs> slowing us down, so I imagine that might that might change slightly with the. Uh, also, was just using a flag. Yeah, we're using a light flag. With the way those rapids work, or the way like the courses work, are there? It's like the whatever that that course in um, in Paris. Yeah. Could that be changed through like whatever uh, machinery is underneath? Like, could they change yeah. the jets or they move something differently so that it could be like a completely different course? So they've got these blocks. They're called rapid blocks, yeah. and they're kind of like Lego that they can mm. stack ah, to different sizes okay. and, and position in in different places in the water. So the the main like structure of the course is set, but then they can tweak the the waves to look a bit different or okay. to act differently, um, which is really cool because it means we can. Uh, modify the course and mix it up a little bit. Mm. Okay, that makes so you train during, uh, using different block setups essentially. Uh, they don't change it too often, but in Penrith we we're able to do that too. And and I remember in the lead up to Tokyo when we couldn't travel because of COVID, we tweaked different parts of the course so that they would we would turn up to training and it would be a different course. So mm. we'd have to adapt yep. and you know work on different skills. So that was really cool to be able to do that. But they wouldn't change it, say, like, they didn't change it in Paris from no, like, no. the semi to the final. No, no, no. no. The, the blocks thing. are, like, That's the course it. configuration is the same. I think mm. they set that in May and it was okay. the same the whole way through the games. But the gates changed on the course. So uh, okay. between the heats and the semis, the, ca- the gates moved a little bit, so it made it harder. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And then between semis and finals, it's the same course. Okay. We, um, we've been remarking, like, Western Sydney is just so hot right now. Like, is there something in the water out there mm. that's just driving you all on? Yeah, it's all in the Nepean. <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? Or you get rid on the... Well, there was, like, a photo of you, Nathan, clearing Pat Cummins, and you're like, yeah. holy shit. It's undeniable. There's it's some good sport, and, and then, you know, Paige Hadley and Noemi Fox. And well, of course. Some great blood come out of Western Sydney in terms of sporting um, skill and talent. So, yeah, no, it's awesome at the moment. Panthers territory, Panthers Fox territory, fan? yes, definitely. Bit of a celebrity out there. I've actually only been home one day since I got back, mm. um, and so I don't know what it's going to be like to go back and in terms of, you know, just walking down the street. But it is lovely the support that I get from from Penrith and from out west. I think everyone's you know been super lovely, super proud. Everyone was cheering us on, and I saw some footage of like our old primary schools getting dressed up and you know putting signs up and drawings and everything. So it's That's been cool. really lovely. That's awesome. We the, when they were cutting back to the White Water Western City White Water Club, is that yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Very wholesome. Oh, they were yeah, so cute nice. at Panthers. They were having a watch party at you know one a.m. with the kids. Yeah, it was so cute. And so, do you have interests outside of the paddling game that I guess you, or do you need anything to sort of like escape from? You know what I mean? When you're like, I yeah. need a break from. Yeah, I think so. Dialed into this. <laughs> I think I've always um, had other things sort of on the side to be busy and to do other things and. T- I think it was instilled in me by my parents to just be like, okay, no, you need to study so that you're preparing for life after sport. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, studying at the moment. Well, not at the moment, but I am studying. What are you studying? Still, uh, MBA through Griffith Uni, okay. all online, so I can sort of fit it in around training mm-hmm. and competition. Um, but I've taken a gap semester at the moment to focus on the Olympics. Makes sense. It seems right. Um, because yeah, I'm a very last minute kind of student who ends up just really stressed doing all nighter. Yep. to try and cram in an assignment. So, yeah, that's I'm not the best at time management in that sense. Um, but, yeah, so study and doing a few other things around media and at the moment doing a bit of work with TV, which has mm, been really fun. Good. Yeah, you were on the, the morning show the other day. Yeah, is I'm on the Today that? Show, uh, reading Kyle the sport and... news. Nice. Oh, yeah. is that – you're reading the sports news, were you? I am, yeah. yeah. And presenting a Logie. Oh, yeah, I presented it a Logie. How's that? Yeah. Do you get nervous doing that? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? That's sort of, it's different. Yeah, I was nervous doing that. I think because it was, I don't mind being in a room. Mm. Like, that's fine. But the fact that then it was, you know, live mm. TV and mm. an auto-cue and everything. So it yeah. was... Auto-cue's tough. And it's yeah. a bit different. Like, it's a it's bit not different. something you do every day, right? 
Yeah, and I was just super scared I was going to stack it in heels <laughs> on stage or something. Yeah. But um, it went well. It was all good. It was, what was the logie for? Uh, it was for best sport coverage. So the FIFA Women's World Cup won, oh, which nice. was awesome. Fair enough. Nice. Um, That's fair. Yeah, no, that was really that was cool awesome. to see them take it out. It was such a good – that was such a great time. Such a pure, it yeah. was such so a pure good. time for the nation. Yeah. I loved yeah. it. I know. It was awesome. Do you find it hard to adjust back to – normality after winning gold medals going to the olympics you've like it's all you've thought about i assume for three years and now it's over it's it feels strange to think that it's over it was three weeks ago i'm like it just still feels like yesterday i'm still in that bubble of like you know reliving the moment and people coming up to me and saying oh i watched your race and i was up at 3 a.m and you were amazing blah 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 or you made me cry and those moments are still kind of replaying noemi and i keep looking at each other like did this just happen? Did we do this? This mm. is amazing. So we're still in that bubble, I think. But I remember after Tokyo, it did take a little while to get back into routine and get mm. back. I, at the moment, I'm still super busy doing, you know, this sort of stuff and mm. media. But I think once I get home and get back into routine, I'll want to just crave, you know, being back on the water in the gym, um, finding my groove again. And yeah. Is that how, is that routine just sort of that's how you can just park that and just get back to routine and just push through it. Yeah, I think like I've – it's important to celebrate what you've achieved sure. and, you know, live this moment and, you know, embrace the opportunities and, and everything that, that comes with it um, and celebrate with those who supported us. But then I find I need to like what's next? Mm -hmm. You know, what what's my next goal? What uh, What's the next event that I'm working towards? Um, yeah, I, I'm just that kind of person I need to get back on the horse and get back on the water. And I know that if I leave it too long, it's going to be awful getting back into training. Are you, have you been a big goal setter throughout your life? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I remember, you know, you talked about my ATAR um, when we started, but like. As very a, impressive, by the way. Uh, yeah, very you. impressive. <laughs> There's a reason I started with that. Yeah, that's more impressive it's, than it. It's almost unachievable. Yeah, but, exactly. I mean, I was in year 12 and wrote on a piece of paper, London 2012 and the Olympic rings. And then underneath, 97.4 ATAR, which was just a random high number. Mm. But, like, I've always sort of been that kind of visual goal-setting dreamer, you know, mm -hmm. to, to write it down, to put it up, to work towards something and um, almost, like, put it out into the universe, you know, like I'm working towards this goal. And even if I look back to the start of the year, what I wrote in my, you know, training diary – it's not something I look at every day because I know what I'm working towards. But if I look back at the end of the year, I know that I would have ticked off most of those things. So I've always been big on, yeah, on the goal setting, on writing it down um, and breaking it into little chunks, not getting, you know, too disheartened when you feel like you're so far from it. But yeah, it's pretty powerful to get you on track and, mm. and keep you there. Do you put pressure on yourself? Like are you... I just – and I, I just go back to the ATAR for a second. <laughs> but, like, there's, some, there's something, like, about what it takes to get really high scores, whether it's in the ATAR or try and do these amazing things at the Olympics that take, I imagine, a bit of, like, almost – well, I guess just pressure on yourself that goes beyond, the, like, you don't allow yourself to get away with cutting corners or doing anything mm. else. Like, the outcome is very important. So, like, if you don't achieve it, do you get down on yourself or do you just hit every goddamn goal that you're <laughs> putting out there? No, I mean, yeah, you're, you're always going to have some failures and some setbacks. Um, but I think it, it, there was this really beautiful poem that Bronte Campbell wrote and she had this line that was like, the victory is in the striving. And I really love that because, yes, you're aiming high and if you get it, that's awesome. But if you miss it, there's still so much value in the work you've put in to try and get that goal um, that, you know, it's going to serve you for the next time you try or for, you mm -hmm. know, your next um, goal. And I think, you know, with my study or with sport, um, I love I, – I need that to be motivated. Otherwise, yeah. I feel like what am I working towards if it's not, you know, a certain benchmark or goal that I'm working towards. I can't really get motivated. Mm. So I need that. But I also don't let myself – be down too long if I don't hit the goal. You know, I've failed. I, I've, I've missed a few races. I've not performed like I wanted to, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of positives to come out of it. And you've just got to be able to switch your mindset to go, what did I learn? What was this meant to teach me? How can I use it to be better? 
Have you got, had you have any heroes currently or heroes growing up that you sort of inspire you? I, well, I was, um, you know, always. That may, but sorry to cut you off. That may be, yeah, you know, obviously your family and your friends, your mum, but like any athletes that people may not have heard of. Um, I mean, I think everyone's probably heard of the ones I was looking up to as a kid, but, you know, I watched the Sydney Olympics and Athens Olympics and Susie O'Neill and Anna Mears were like the two that really inspired me. And so it was this full circle moment to be on the same team as Anna Mears in 2012 and then have her as our chef de mission in 2024. And then, you know, sharing that kind of journey with her because she's had so many setbacks in terms of a, like an accident that broke where she broke her neck and then came back 10 months later and, mm. and won a medal at the Olympics. Um, and obviously then, you know, being one of our best athletes in, in Olympic history. But yeah, I think inspired by those who just put themselves out there as well and who are able to perform time after time, you know, the Roger Federer's and Nadal's I've always loved their work ethic and their manner of performing um but yeah i think we've got so many amazing sports people in australia to look up to and be inspired by potters and dribblers just taking a moment out of this wonderful podcast to thank one of our sponsors who are also wonderful and that would be neds without whom nothing would be possible without whom we wouldn't be sitting here in such nice chairs these vintage boys you would be on stools or something we'd be on stools or we might even just have like pogo sticks up our bums Listen, we wouldn't be comfortable. No. Know that. And having comfortable hosts is the essence required to produce quality dribble and yarn. That's right. Now, head to Ned's, download the app, follow along on our profiles if you want to see what we're getting after, or you can join the About Even group. It's as simple as that. Ned's make it easy. What's gambling really costing you? For free and confidential support, call the number on screen or visit the website. When you're in the village and um, and like you're all, you're also you're around athletes that have had success, you're around athletes that are just sort of happy to be there. There's like many different people. Are, I've got different goals. What, mm. what they're there for. Is it difficult, or do you sort of to, to deal with athletes who are like very disappointed? You know, you're yeah. there with a couple of golds around the neck, and it's probably a little. You know, don't worry, it's all good. But like, is it? What do you do there just to try and? I guess lean, it could be someone you can they can talk to or lean on, or do you sort of have to let people go through their process? Yeah, it's tough. I think you have such a mix at the games where, you know, for some people getting a PB, making a final, making a semi-final, that's the goal and that's what they've achieved and they're thrilled. And then you have others who have won a silver medal and they're devastated because it's a loss. Or mm. um, And then others who were a medal hope and, and didn't quite get there. And... I think it's just about having empathy and having space for them if they want to chat and if they don't, you know, you're you're leaving them to process it. Mm. But I think, you know, one example that I think of is like Harry Garside. Yes. He's just an absolutely beautiful human and, you know, he really put himself out there wanting to win a gold medal for Australia and when he didn't do it, he, you know, calls himself a failure and has been super tough on himself. Mm. But Australia's just rallied around him and giving him this big warm hug. And that's what we're doing too, you know, as, as a teammate for him. I'm like, but, you know, you've still inspired so many people. Yes, you're personally disappointed and devastated, but like you're an amazing person in the way you hold yourself and the story you put out and the messages you put out. So I think there's different stories to celebrate in our team. Yes, the gold medal moments are amazing, but there's also, um, you know, the ones who have overcome injuries and setbacks and picked themselves up and finished the race and the ones who are breaking through and, um, you know, the Saya Kakibaras who oh. have this incredible family story with her brother Kai. Like, the Olympics just makes me cry constantly <laughs> hearing and yeah. watching all our, you know, amazing athletes and their stories. That was particularly emotive, that one. Yeah. So I Sakaki Barra, I went onto Kai Sakaki Barra's Instagram and saw the video that he'd done, like this production piece for so Channel I, Nine, yeah. I was in bits. Yeah. yeah I was in absolute bits. Mm -hmm. And then when she like looks for him after she comes off the I day, so I'm like, Christ <laughs> alive. Like you can't it's watch so that hard. and not just be in tears. And not yeah. be in tears. You just I can't. Know. I was watching it in bed because I was racing the next day and it was like 9 30, 10 pm and I'm just bawling my <laughs> eyes out. Oh yeah. Messaging her to be like because we'd messaged the day before and I said, you know, good luck, you got this and 
proud of you. And she said, I'm going to join you. You know, I'm going to join you with that gold medal. And so she did it. So it was just amazing. And there were so many beautiful stories and pieces to come out of these games that I think so many Aussies got behind and discovered new athletes and fell in love with so many of them. One of the great post-win uh, Interviews of all time as well. So, so was, oh yeah, yeah. fantastic! <laughs> I just fantastic. fucking went. <laughs> I just fucking went for it. Just fucking went for it. Where, how, how, um, how? I know you like you don't have time off because you're going to go and race again, which seems insane. But then, like, what? When do you start preparing for uh, for LA? Like, what's that? So, what's the the runway Journey. look like? Yeah. Well, it's four years away. We had three years between Tokyo and Paris, which came around really quick. Mm-hmm. Um, next year we have the World Championships in Penrith. You're invited if you want to come. I'm clipping that up. We'll make sure that thing we, the World Champs in Penrith. World we'll Champs in Penrith. We'll be so in the family box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, running down the running down the side. I yeah. want you on the commentary. You did such a great job for my race. Yeah, happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll wheel the bed out there. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be the the next sort of big event for us. Um, World Champs at home and um. Have yeah. they? When was the last time they've been out there? 2005. So okay. I had that broken arm What's that you spoke deal? about last time. Okay, um, that's a good. Out. Later, so then. yeah, 20 years later and 25 years since the Sydney Olympics. So pretty awesome to welcome the world back to to Penrith for that. So looking forward to that. And then 2026, the the world champs will be at the venue for the LA Olympics. Okay. Um, so that'll be an important race to sort of get the feel for the course and see what that's like. Mm-hmm. And then we start that qualifying process for the games in 2027. So each year is kind of important, mm. um, but you also have that freedom to test equipment, to you know fine tune things. Um, some athletes will have a break this year or next year because you've still got three years until the game. So everyone's different really. Do you uh, set your year up into seasons, quote under quote? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so usually um, we've got like our domestic season, which goes from December to end of Feb and then um, the international season starts in June till September um, when we have the world champs. You are talking about equipment there. Does the equipment constantly, is it like constantly being improved and like changed or is it relatively sort of consistent? It's interesting because some things have changed. Like when my parents used to race, they had four metre boats that did not turn. Okay. Like they look so yeah. slow when they race and now they're a lot shorter, but each year there's not heaps that changes in terms of equipment, but minor details change in terms of like, you know, how many millimeters your tail, the back of your boat is and things like that might differ or what size or for me, it's like the fit out. So we've been working with engineers at the AIS to, to change like my fit out to make it easier and, and more efficient to, move between boats and things like that. So you're always looking for those 1% improvements. Yeah. Now between the two, like C1, K1, are you sitting in one and kneeling in another? Yeah. Yes. So sitting in the kayak with double blade and then kneeling in the canoe with a single blade. Because you, you can't so tell. you got a bit more you height. You can't tell. So you no. can it's be a bit more height, yeah. So it gives you a little bit more leverage and stability to, I guess, reach with the single blade. Um, you're more on top of the water and then in the kayak, your legs are out in front so – it kind of makes it a little bit heavier on the front of the boat, but you're also more stable because you're seated and you've got your mm. knees and you're gripping and your hips can support you as well. Is it common for people to be good at both, typically? Um, a lot more common now, but traditionally athletes would just do one event. <laughs> it's more common now that you're good at both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> a lot of the, yeah. a lot no, of the kids it. coming <laughs> through now do both. A lot yeah. of the boys, it's mainly been the girls who do it both um, because the women's canoe category um, – came into the world champs program back in 2010 and so a lot of the girls from my generation who were juniors back then grew up doing both events um whereas the boys traditionally have kind of stuck to one or the other but yeah you see a lot more more doing both now are you talking equipment before what's the quote that you have on your helmet it's um it's a song quote that my grandpa used to sing to us so my dad's Uh, My mum's dad, sorry, uh, my French grandpa, he was the president of the kayak club. So I grew up like, I remember just being in the club all the time when mum was training for the Olympics. And he used to sing a song to us that basically that lyric translates to, my little girl is like the water, she's like the white water. And he passed away a few years ago and didn't get to see us at the Olympics. So it was my little connection to him having Mm. him with me on the water. 
Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he that's knew something. He knew something seriously. back then. <laughs> but also, like, you've just come from a serious pedigree of paddling stock there. So even your granddad was into it. Yeah, he he never competed um, mm. at a high level, but he helped found the first kayak club in Marseille in the south of France. And so that's where my mom started. And, um, yeah, he, he was pretty amazing for the club there and getting kids in, in boats and, and on the water. Well, paddling royalty. Paddle, paddling paddling <laughs> royalty. There you go. That's what it is. Oh, like you don't have to say. You don't have to say. We'll say. We'll, say it. <laughs> we'll call this. We'll call this paddling royalty with Jess Fox. Uh, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. It was me really on. nice to chat. Unbelievable. Loved it. Congratulations you. on your goals. Obviously, we are slightly miffed you didn't bring them in. If it's, I've, w- I've made my piece. I've, I'm going <laughs> to have to. We processed it and we'll let it go. But. Um, Listen, I might have told some people like Jess Fox coming in. Well, I know, yeah, I listen, don't worry, so we'll put the gold medals on for proof. Look, yeah. I was up at 3 a.m. this morning and I did not, I, I didn't have everything set up no. and ready to go. It's not your I'm fault, it's my sorry. fault for going off too early <laughs> telling people that I'm going to hold a gold medal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was no, too but you will. You will, you will. I will, you will see them one day. We'll have to get you out to Penrith we'll to go there, down the rapids. We'll get on the water. And I'll make sure to bring them then. So if we just inbox you and say, can we come out? Is that going to be? <laughs> yeah, just one yeah. day. We're on, wait, we're on the way. We're on the way. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the way. Be there in five. Yeah, could you blow up a couple of bucks for us? <laughs> we're on the way. Um, well, do you like the gold me- the medals? Are, it's funny, they felt like something that grew on me in terms of the image. Really? Sense. You didn't like it? it? wasn't I didn't like it. It was just the front of it. I was like, the initial thing I saw on the front was like a pizza cutter. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <so laughs> that's just I sort of what came beautiful. to my, my my brain. But then after, like, you just—I mean, it was like I, I fell in love with them almost in, after the first night. The moment I learned that it was the Eiffel Tower, I go, "Yep, I'm yeah, the Eiffel yeah, Tower bit in the middle is really cool." That was a very cool. Because I was like, "Why? That's not gold." Why yeah, why? That? What's yeah, this piece what's of this, what's this grey metal? Hunk? Yeah, no, it was—they're beautiful. They're they are heavy, beautiful. They're solid. Like, I'm embarrassed yeah. to say, my first thought was they're cutting corners. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're starting. No, we're starting to critique the Olympics on what they're doing with the medals. No, um, but also, the, well, who's this American skateboarder? Niger, Niger Houston. Niger Houston. Yeah. Who, like, do you see the thing he put up where he's like, "What the fuck's with these medals?" I'm like, I feel like you might have had a huge rip with the medals, <laughs> and like he probably took them out to every nightclub. And yeah, he's <laughs> like, "Well, what? The boys can't wear them." I'm like, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not your skateboarding friends, Niger. Anyway. I think I think they had a few issues with the bronze medals, but they're getting replaced. So. Oh, really? So there yeah. was actually. Yeah. Do we, need, do we have Nigel an apology? Sorry. I Nigel. don't know. I, I think I think there all the bronze medals that I have, yeah, oh. they're all getting replaced. Oh, and, oh shit! Yeah, yeah. Okay. You don't have to worry that, do you? Nah, no. the gold one's no. fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a few dents and like scratches because they keep clanging oh, against no. each other, which is <laughs> a good problem to have. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. It? Yeah. And where do you keep them? Do you keep them in that like special box? Are you going to have like a place for them or do you give them to Yeah, the mum and box dad is or? beautiful, but it's really big. So I can't easily, you know, bring them around. So they were in like a sock for a while, mm. but now I've got these little pouches that I put them in. Oh, cool. Um, and they're usually in my handbag and I'm really sorry. Do not. Them. Look, we're being <laughs> assholes. <laughs> uh, again, thank you very much. Congratulations on all the, thank all you the very success. Much thank you. And we'll see you out on the rapids. And thanks for doing the best commentary ever for thank our you. races. It was that awesome. means a lot. Actually. It was the least we could do. Sure. Do we think that we, we loved the energy. to the gold? Absolutely. The yeah. intensity that you paddled with that umbrella or whatever it was. It was an Australian flag. The flag yep. was, it definitely helped me get down the yep. rapids. So I appreciate like it. It. Also us death riding your opponents. Yeah. Um, you know, we need True. to do that. Such purity. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that morning. Yeah. But now, look, it's all worth it. It's all worth this it, exactly. You <laughs> Thank you again. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Well, there you have it. One of the greats. I enjoyed that thoroughly. Yeah, I enjoyed it. That was great. Yeah. What a winner. Well, listen. What a great Australian. Great Australian. Just like, just well-spoken, nor- very normal person. Consummate professional. Consummate professional. I'm a huge, I was already a huge fan. High achiever. High achiever. High UAI, I don't want to dwell on it, but it was high. Or ATAR now, fucking sue me. 99.91. Or 99.1. Like, get out of here with those numbers. I can't believe she came on. The reason I'm so impressed by the ATAR, Edward, is it allows me to peg myself to her. Now, I know that I'm not an ATAR guy. I'm an idiot. I got 70-odd. But, like... It's the only comparison you've got. It's the only comparison I've got. Because you're not a failed paddler. No. And to be honest, I'm too close to her in that. I should really be like, just get one of those streety participation medals. Terrific stuff. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Jess Fox. Shout out to the punters. Shout out to the dribbler. Uh, that's what happens when you put your nation first. Yeah. That's what happens. Yep. Bruce in the pudding. Bruce in the pudding. Uh. Could you two just not talk anymore? <laughs>